Okay, good evening, everybody. This is a public hearing on the FY24 capital budget, supplemental appropriations to the FY23 capital budget, and amendments to the FY23 to 28 CIP for county government, MCPS, Montgomery College, MNCPPC, Washington Suburban Transit Commission, the Revenue Authority, HOC, and municipality and state projects, and the FY 24 to 29 CIP for WSSC Water. We have 12 individuals who will be testifying in person, and we have nine who will be with us virtually. Uh, but first, I want to thank uh, and welcome Troop 457 for joining us this evening. I hope you learn a lot for your badge. So with that, uh, I will invite the first five individuals up to join us, uh, Rockville Mayor Bridget Newton, um, Dr. Alexandra DeStanito, uh, Melissa McKenna, Joanna Thomas, and Paul Geller. Okay. Mayor Newton, you have three minutes. Nope, uh, right in front by the speaker, by the microphone. Thank there you. you. You'd think I hadn't done this before. Good evening, President Glass and members of the County Council. I'm Bridget Donald Newton, Mayor of the City of Rockville. And on behalf of our entire council, thank you for the opportunity to comment on the County Executive's recommended CIP. Many schools serving Rockville students are still plagued with decrepit and overcrowded facilities. We politely but urgently ask for your support for the following Rockville Priority MCPS capital projects. Complete the approved Twinbrook Elementary School Major Capital Project Feasibility Study ASAP so that funding is included in the next CIP. As we've pointed out for many years, this is a matter of equity and inclusion for this underserved community. The facility needs a complete rebuild. It's not ADA compliant, lacks, lacks space for individualized student support, which is critical to closing the achievement gap, and the pavement surrounding the school is like driving over craters. Include an amendment to the CIP to expedite the Wooten High School major capital project to an August 26 completion date. We are deeply concerned about the repeated delays by the County Council, thus the current projected completion date of August 29. We've heard directly from cluster leaders about the negative emotional impact this aging and deteriorated facility is having on Wooten students. This major capital project must be equitably prioritized. Expedite the opening of Crown Farm High School to September 25, not August 26. This new school will relieve persistent overcrowding at Richard Montgomery and will support additional housing, which we all need, but want. We need safe school space to do that. Fund the build out of the second floor shell of the Carl Sandburg Learning Center, which has been co-located with Maryville Elementary. It's more expensive and disruptive to do it in stages, and we saw at Bayard Rustin that it is true. Build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. Reopen Woodward High School on August 26 and improve a feasibility study for a major capital project at Gaithersburg Middle School. There are two issues in the Lincoln Park and East Rockville neighborhoods that have been neglected by the county for decades, and it's past time that we remove the blight and make this community safer and bring in affordable housing and community amenities. Retain the CE's recommendation of $2.5 million for the relocation of the sagging MCPS material management facility including the removal of the unusable trailers from the site in its current location in Lincoln Park, our, Af our historic African-American community. This funding was removed by the County Council in the approved 23 CIP. I personally cannot fathom how this facility has been allowed to remain in this state of disrepair and disrespect, and this glaring inequity needs to be addressed immediately. One of our many shared goals is to increase the amount of quality workforce and affordable housing, and this is what the community wants and we support. Include an amendment to fund phase two of the historic Lincoln High School renovation ASAP to prevent any further deterioration. This building is a historic treasure for Lincoln Park, the city of Rockville, and the county. The phase one work to make minor envelope repairs in FY23 does not address major structural deficiencies, environmental concerns, and fire code issues. Once again, this is a matter of respect for the community and justice in addressing previous segregation of education in our county. Reconsider the construction of a, a restoration center as currently proposed, whether on the currently proposed Seven Locks Road location or next, to Rock or next to any Rockville neighborhood. Excuse me. We ask that you engage with our city and our residents to address numerous safety issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Newton. Uh, Dr. Donito. 
Good evening, Council uh, President Glass and Council Members. Uh, this is in reference to the, the budget item Lincoln High School P362302 and Material Management Building Relocation P652305. I am Dr. Dais Denito, President of the Lincoln Park Lee Civic Association in the historic African American neighborhood in Rockville. I am also a member of the Stone Street Co Coalition. The Stone Street Coalition is a growing group of community members, nonprofits, and private sector partners advocating for the implementation of the adopted Stone Street 2040 Master Plan. The Civic Association has been working on this Master Plan for years. We understand that Rockville is not the only city that requires assistance for redevelopment. Reading through the list of projects and the sheer amount of dollars allocated is indeed overwhelming. We empathize with you making difficult decisions about that, what stays in and what's out in the fiscal year 2040, um, 2040 um, 24 budget. But what I am advocating for tonight comes down to social justice for a neighborhood that has been historically neglected. The leaders of the Lincoln Park Civic Association has been requesting monies for fixing our first historic black high school for decades. And when we obtained some, it was limited to $1.5 million, covering only partially what is required to complete the work in FY23. And in the current proposed budget, no additional fund is allocated. We have been advocating for decades to remove the awful trailer park on North Stone Street Avenue and relocate the materials management building. Not only the building itself is hazardous for workers here, the associated uh, trailers have been a blighting effect on the surrounding community. We are saddened that no money is allocated in FY24 for the relocation after waiting for so long already. We respectfully disagree and invite you to, uh, to tour our North Stone Street in person at your earliest convenience. The previous president of the Lincoln Park Civic Association, Mrs. Fran Hawkins, passed away on December 26, 2021. She battled not only for her health, but also against industrial encroachment on our neighborhood for years. She too advocated for this trailer park to be replaced by affordable housing and make up for gentrification brought upon our communities of colors all over Montgomery County by the inadequate application of the previous wage and corridors master plan. Mrs. Hawkins will unfortunately not be there for FY24 budget application. And I wish that my children who grow up passing these trailers every day will be able to afford housing in their community in my own lifetime. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Donito. Ms. McKenna. Good evening. My name is Melissa McKenna. So many new faces. Welcome. <laughs> and I'm not new here. As the county focuses on equity and access, I am compelled to stress beyond looking beyond skin color and the rainbow and remember our differently abled residents. Mobility and visibility and vision challenges abound. ADA compliance should not be a use it or lose it funding category. I strongly disagree with the county executive and there should never be a savings on ADA modifications because the money wasn't spent. Please return to the approved FY23 budget of 4.4 million. At the very least, help Rockville with sidewalk ADA access to county buildings, or that 1.5 million could go to MCPS specifically earmarked for Burning Tree Elementary School or Wooten High School ADA improvements. With equity, there also needs to be fairness. This is an off year for the CIP and many new projects are introduced. In the zero sum game that is the CIP budget, something will have to give to finance these projects. The challenge now is meeting the escalating costs of projects already underway. Please press pause on new projects and instead consider, consider addressing many long-standing delays. Rockville Fire Station number three, Eastern Middle School, Clarksburg Library, and Observation Drive Extended. For my very first council CIP testimony in February 2014, I arrived using a walker. I would not be sitting in this chair if it was 2014. I understand we all have staffing challenges. However, you need to recognize that this needs to be an accessible building. That testimony included support of a paltry $500,000 from the county for partial funding towards the renovation of the Rockville Fire Station number three. Time check. It's a decade later and it's still deferred. 
Please, please fund this most important adequate public facility without delay. Eastern Middle School has been to be determined for as long as I can remember, again, at least 10 years. Long story short, MCPS needs a middle school holding facility for them to go to, and it does not have one. Instead of adding another project to the MCPS major capital projects, recognizing that all are worthy and desperately needed, please deliver on broken promises first. In 2020, I tried to say, yay, the Clakesburg Library is in the CIP. But with planning and construction money in the out years, it just made the project a pretty promise. Those dates remain, and I urge you to keep the library on schedule. Observation Drive extended, and of course, Mid-County Highway, um, Mr. Nelson addressed this afternoon. As far as schools go, the new batch of elephants, the high schools, three new ones in a six-year CIP, never had a chance to begin with. Despite the cost, which just escalates, I am concerned with how facilities are built. Net zero energy schools should be the only schools planned and built at this point. Net zero ready begins at the foundation. It's not an aftermarket add-on. As I always ask the BOE, please spend wisely and always show your work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKenna. Ms. Thomas. The button's right in front by the microphone. There you go. Good evening, President Glass, Vice President Friedson, members of the board. My name is Johanna Thomas and I live in Burtonsville, Maryland. My husband and I moved to this community after being an active duty family for 20 years. I've had sons enrolled in over four elementary schools in various states. And this current school where we had a choice to move instead of the Navy telling us where to move is sadly in the greatest disrepair. Yet we are in the wealthiest county we have ever lived in. We chose Burtonsville because of its diversity here. We have neighbors from so many countries and our son has diverse friends and classmates as well. We know that diversity makes a positive difference in students' lives as it does in our own. If Montgomery County is committed to equity for all its diverse citizenry, especially its youngest, then you must be committed to the students at Burtonsville Elementary and funding the new school that we desperately need. I am here to express my support for the full funding request for a replacement school for Burtonsville Elementary. The current facilities at Burtonsville are no longer suitable for the needs of students and staff. The issue of overcrowding is a major concern with students having limited space to learn and grow. This not only affects their education, but also their mental and physical well-being. Furthermore, the current grounds of the school pose safety concerns for both students and staff with cars and buses navigating narrow, inadequate pathways during drop-off and pickup times daily. Parents are helping cars and buses safely navigate the grounds. Why? Why is this acceptable for our students? Additionally, the current school has limited space for lunch, leading to lunch periods that run the entire day. My son has his lunch in the morning when he just had breakfast at home. And sometimes he's too full from breakfast to eat all his lunch. Then this leads to his afternoon with an empty stomach until the end of the day, which is close to 4 p.m. I know that this has caused academic performance issues as well as focus issues for him. And I'm sure he is not the only child at Burtonsville because the lunch schedule um, issues are created. The No Kid Hungry organization conducted a study in 2020 which showed that children who struggle with, struggle with hun hunger excuse me, tend to have lower academic performance which are more likely to repeat a grade or have poor attendance in school. The study also found that children facing hunger are more likely to have experienced behavioral and emotional issues, which could further impact their ability to learn and succeed in school. The findings emphasize the critical importance of addressing childhood hunger to improve educational outcomes overall for the overall well-being of, being of children. How is this treatment of our students equitable? The county prides itself on equity. Our, our students are not included in this equity. Ms. Thomas, yes. your time is up. Thank you. If you want to email the rest of your comments to us, we'd be glad to read them. Sure, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Geller. Thank you. Uh, good evening. 
Um, I just wanted to clarify what my distinguished colleague, Ms. McKenna, was saying. We were trying to actually get in the building through the back earlier tonight, and uh, there was no one there. I, I realize it's hard to find people to work at all places, so it was a little frustrating to a few people. The positive side was I got to walk in with a parent from Burtonsville Elementary. I guess it's one of your friends who's here to support you. And it, it reminded me from my PTA days of how much they really do need a new building there. And how much, you know, it, it's challenging for you because you write one, they write one paycheck. They write one check and then the, count, the uh, public schools has to decide how to spend it. But you can influence it and you're doing a great job influencing it now because you influenced me to talk about it a bit tonight. So thank you for doing that. Uh, earlier tonight, I, earlier this afternoon, I came by and I told you to, I asked you to support Bill 123 with some modifications. One of the things that I always believe in doing is never coming here and asking you to do something that's going to cost you money without finding you money to repay that. And I'm here to do that tonight. There's a project that's actually in my physical neighborhood, uh, North High Street project, that's supposed to receive over $1.3 million of funding. This project is not needed whatsoever. It's 60 feet long, and I, I also had the pleasure, because we were locked out, of coming in with Troop 457. And uh, so, good to see you all here. Thank you for being here. My son is an Eagle Scout at 264, just got it last year. He and I pulled out the tape measure, and we went over to North High Street the other day to measure it. Because we wanted to see why a project that actually, in some total, costs $2.169 million is needed. We measured it out, and we said it's 60 feet long, this road. Technically, it's 60 feet long. That's $36,150 per foot for a road that's really not needed. Talk about a road for privileged people that's not needed. The reason for this road is so people can get to Dunkin' Donuts and to McDonald's faster. There's no other reason for it. In my testimony, and I've lived in this neighborhood for 14 years. I showed you a map. I let Siri show you how I get from place to place. And none of the roads are the ones that the Department of Transportation, bless their hearts, said that I should be taking to get to that restaurant that I patronize and all these other businesses that I patronize. I would much prefer that you take, it's going to be at least $1.3 million left, if not more, because you won't have to acquire these properties. Use it for tax breaks for seniors and for retired military personnel who decide to live in this county. It should provide for at least 1,000 tax breaks. That would be a huge difference. So even if you did what I requested, and that is to lower the threshold to 30 years for uh, residents and also for uh, military, it would be a great benefit to the community. The North High Street project is very dangerous as well. I've written about it in my testimony, and I thank you for allowing me to speak a second time today. Thank you, Mr. Geller. Good to see you as always. Uh, that concludes this panel. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I also just want to take a moment and recognize Rockville Councilmember Monique Ashton. Thank you, Councilmember, for joining us this evening. Uh, the next panel, uh, if uh, Mr. Link Hoeing, Minel Patel, Minal Patel, Nicholas Basie, Hannah Fisher, and Benjamin Lewis could all join us. Mr. Hoeing, we'll start with you. Good evening. I am Link Hoeing from the Fair Access Committee for the Western County. We were created by the citizens and supported by the town of Poolsville to push for equity in the provision of county and state services and for facilities in our area. Not only did the county fail to modernize our high school for decades, even though it was the oldest in the county, it even tried to close the school from the 1950s through the 1980s. We are many miles from a senior center, community center, and among other things, needed health services. The last council, including the incumbents here tonight, helped begin to address these issues by including in the county budget money to fund our high school and rebuild it. Given the focus on equity I heard often from those just elected, we have faith this new council will continue the progress that has been made. In reality, what I am proposing today are not new spending programs. They are really catch-up programs to invest in services and programs that we should have already had out in our county to match those in most of the rest of the county. First, we would like to see funding for the Promise Community Center, if not in this fiscal year, then the next. 
A POR for the center has already been completed and MCPS has reserved space in its plans for the high school to co-locate the center. Second, the CIP suggests that a number of schools will have funding to build wellness centers and we were a part of a coalition to help support that initiative. Poolsville, despite our unique situation far removed from convenient access to supporting medical and health services, is not included. Given that the high school is being rebuilt, it makes sense from an equity and fiscal standpoint to include in the CIP for this year or the next funding for a wellness center. Third, we have had to push MCPS for many months to finally agree to include in our high school's plans a comparably sized gym to other main gyms in other high schools. We are uncertain if there's funding enough in the current allocation for the school to fund the new gym, but if not, it should be included this fiscal year so there are no delays in the construction of the school. Fourth, we have a very large population of old, older people, lots of young families, and a very competitive swim team. A year-round pool could help older people who need rehabilitation, provide healthy recreation for our seniors and families year-round, and give our swim team even more opportunities to succeed. And finally, and I'm really uh, wishing a prayer here, once White Ferry gets operational again, money should be included in next year's fiscal budget to make improvements in the roadway and the operational systems for the ferry that can increase its capacity and efficiency so it can handle more traffic as per the funding, the study that you and the other council in Loudoun County funded in 2021. And let me just close by saying I would love to have all of you come out and meet us at our local watering hole called Locals that has really uh, become a major community spot. We'd love to see all of you out there as soon as you can come out. Thank you to, uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Patel. Good evening. My name is Mino Patel and I'm a parent of two students at Burnsville Elementary. Burnsville Elementary has been in the CIP budget for over 10 years. It is not a new start project and I urge this council to provide funding for it this fiscal year. My daughters and friends, they started their school day today at 9.30 a.m. with breakfast in the classroom. About one hour later, some of the students, they packed up their lunches, they gathered up their lunches and headed to the cafeteria. Yes, students are eating lunch at 10.40 a.m. after just arriving in school. These students are then expected to make it through the full day um, of learning, dismissal at 3.50 and a bus ride home without another scheduled time to eat. And why is that? It's simply because the school building is not adequate. Burnsville Elementary has one of the longest scheduled lunch periods in the county because the building cannot accommodate the existing student population. This requires paraeducators to trade their instruction time for lunch duty. This is just unacceptable. The lack of functional facility adds unnecessary stress on the school administration and the staff. This council talks about equity. Well, equity and justice, and here's a concrete example of what inequity looks like in Montgomery County. Lack of space inside the building is not the only infrastructure problem at Burnsville Elementary. For example, the school is unable to safely accommodate parking for student and parent vehicles, such as for back to school nights. Um, this fall, I did just, uh, I'm sorry, therefore parents are asked to park off site at uh, in the Montgomery County public school bus transports parents to the school. And this fall, I did just that for a back to school night. While chatting with the MCPS bus driver, I learned that this driver arrived at 6 a.m. that morning to transport students to and from school. And at around 8 p.m. Um, that same evening, she was driving me back to my car. Burnsville Elementary's existing infrastructure is negatively impacting MCPS's operating budget and its most critical resource, its human capital. Funding for a new Burnsville Elementary not only relieves this continued impacts, but it also supports MCPS teachers, paraeducators, the bus drivers, the administration, the people who make MCPS a top tier school system. Despite the infrastructure challenges, our children are thriving at Burnsville Elementary and that is because of the administration and the staff. Recently, Burnsville Elementary won the Healthiest School in Montgomery County Award and was recognized as an America's Healthiest School 2022 awardee. Both of these awards are due to the care and attention shown by the staff and administration at Burnsville Elementary. I cannot imagine what this staff and administration could accomplish with the council's support. I urge the council to approve funding for Burnsville Elementary now. This council cannot again fail to recognize the very real needs at Burnsville. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Mr. Bassey. 
Good evening. I'm Nicholas Bassey, Paint Branch Cluster Coordinator for the Montgomery County Council of Parent Teacher Associations, or MCCPTA, which represents 192 county PTAs. The Paint Branch Cluster is in District 5, and it serves approximately 7,700 students across nine vibrant schools, Paint Branch High School and the eight elementary and middle schools feeding into it. We are proud of our fast-growing, diverse, and politically active part of the county and are grateful that the superintendent CIP recommendation includes capital investments in our schools, especially Burtonsville and Greencastle Elementary Schools and Benjamin Banneker Middle School. Burtonsville Elementary was approved for an addition about 10 years ago. This project, despite discussions with architects and consultations with the entire staff, failed to break ground. As I mentioned during last year's hearing, their sp space crisis has continued to worsen without any relief from the council. Their cafeteria, as you've heard, fits only one grade level at a time, for example, resulting in six lunch periods. It is also their only gathering space, so because it hosts lunch from 10.40 in the morning until 2.10 in the afternoon, it's generally unavailable for enrichment activities and assemblies. This lunch schedule also creates staffing issues, such as, as you've heard, paraeducators must trade in instructional time for lunch duty. We hope that you will address these issues by funding the MCPS recommended construction of a new elementary school now rather than in the unpredictable latter years of the current CIP. Greencastle was also approved for an addition to address their space crisis. They now have 10 portable classrooms, two of which just opened last year. This clearly demonstrates that their facility is inadequate. They also only have four sets of bathrooms for 730 students. We request that construction of their addition proceed without delay, bringing about 200 fourth and fifth graders out of portables and back under the main roof. I recently walked the halls of Banneker Middle School with staff and noted myriad age-related CIP issues, including apparently unrepairable leaks in the roof, quasi-functional water heaters, regular plumbing issues and sewage backups, buckling basement walls, and the list goes on. We are glad that Banneker has finally been approved for a feasibility study for a major capital project and request that this proceed without delay. We ask you to not forget about these stark facilities challenges and ask you to fund these, these projects without delay. The age of these schools creates plumbing, security, space, technology, and numerous other challenges not encountered in other parts of our county despite recent discussions about equity. I'll close with this thought. Equity, especially in the CIP, is not about the equal distribution of available resources. It is reallocation based both on historical treatment and present needs. Our part of the county has historically been underfunded in relation to our needs. So we ask you to please work with us to address them by viewing our requests through an equity lens, investing in capital projects via permanent revenue streams like recordation or impact taxes. We thank you for your time, attention, uh, detail, and action partnership for our schools without further delay. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Ms. Fisher. Thank you. <coughs> I'm Hannah Fisher. My family has lived in West Rockville for 40 years. I'm troubled by a CIP budget item with safety implications for the 4,000 plus homes within a mile, some within mere feet of the county detention center. The CIP lists $12 million coming from state coffers and $5 million from county funds through fiscal year 24 to build a 55,000 square foot restoration center next to the detention center. This facility is intended to provide short-term mental health and substance abuse crisis counseling to individual brought, individuals brought by first responders. According to official estimates, this countywide center would render services to more than 1,800 clients annually, plus detention center inmates. Area residents approve of the attended, intended purposes of the center. However, the surrounding community continues to object to the location of the facility near any heavily residential area for safety reasons. Instead, it should be in an office or light industrial area, preferably close to mass transit, as well as to hospitals capable of addressing the most serious cases. The proposed site is nearly four miles from the closest hospital, Shady Grove, an estimated eight-minute drive 
drive. That's a long time and distance in a medical emergency. The area already has experienced a number of dangerous incidents involving release detention center inmates, including a home invasion, trespassing, property damage and theft, and carjackings. Locating the restoration center at the same site is likely to increase area crime as released clients wander throughout surrounding neighborhoods, especially between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. when public transportation shuts down. Moreover, there likely will be little exterior security at this non-criminal facility. To date, the county has not sought input from the surrounding community regarding security. From what residents have observed, the county has been pressing to build the center with minimal community buy-in. County employees apparently have failed to seriously consider other locations and less expensive alternatives, such as leasing existing vacant office space, likely closer to mass transit and farther from residential neighborhoods. Finally, the proposed site is subject to bad optics. One of this project's purposes is to decriminalize mental illness and substance abuse. Locating it next to the detention center certainly is counterproductive. I strongly urge the council to reconsider this issue. The first incident, dangerous either to clients or neighbors, could subject the county government to huge legal liability, something to avoid. Thank you for this opportunity to share these views. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Lewis. Good evening. My name is Ben Lewis. I'm Burtonsville Elementary School PTA Vice President and also Paint Branch Cluster Coordinator. Nicholas won't let me forget that. <laughs> um, I'm here representing the school and I'm uh, the proud father to uh, uh, children that attend school. We request that the council fully fund MCPS recommended construction of a new Burtonsville Elementary School at the proposed uh, Northeast Consortium Elementary School number 17 site. The school, as you've heard now, was uh, been in and out of the C CIP for over a decade. Uh, the project, despite having a completed feasibility study, name architect, and uh, various consultations with the administration and staff, failed to break ground. Uh, the school addition and renovation continued to be included, then removed from the CIP uh, for several years to yo-yo effect. The infrastructure crisis has only worsened, as you've heard uh, from previous testimonies. Um, the biggest issue is the cafeteria. Uh, at 1040 a.m. to 10 to 2 10 p.m. Uh, my kid, my children are suffering the same issues and coming home hungry and not finishing all their uh, their lunch uh, you know one of the else also one of the other uh, uh, issues is that there's only space available for one, one line so what ends up happening is you queue that line and it disrupts the adjoining classes um, an another issue is during arrival and dismissal, the school's traffic infrastructure just can't safely and efficiently accommodate pedestrians and car traffic. The school is uniquely situated. Uh, there are no student walkers and to and from school, which increases the volume of cars for arrival and dismissal and causes a real hazard. Uh, our PTA met with the MCPS planning and real estate team twice this year, and we discussed uh, engaging the community and the new school on, or for the new school site options. They expressed a desire to pick this uh, NEC consortium site uh, number 17. We understand that the superintendent will provide non-recommended non -recommended reductions to the CIP amendment. However, we ask that the council fund this critical community project. The, the building of a new school along with repurposing of the existing school to a new, innovative, flexible uh, recre educational recreational campus, uh, the Burtonsville Access Road, and also the State Highway uh, 198 Improvement Project. These are critical projects for the community. The construction of a new school will energize the community, spur economic development, and help mend eroded trust in the county's commitment to investment in Burtonsville and the East County community. We know that our children, as well as our community, deserve a better commitment and investment from Montgomery County and that, than what's been previously provided. We thank you for your time, and hopefully we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis, and thank you all for bringing your testimony to us this evening. Thank you. Uh, now we have two more individuals who are testifying in person, um, Erica Bailey and Catherine Scott. Mm. 
Ms. Bella, you can go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Erica Bailey. I am pleased to be here this uh, evening to testify as a parent of a junior student attending Wooten High School and a sixth grader attending Frost Middle School. I am also here as a parent volunteer <clears throat> on behalf of the Wooten PTSA as one of the cluster coordinators. My primary objective this evening is to address the capital improvement needs of our Wooten cluster schools and to urge the acceleration of the Wooten, Dufeef, and Cold Spring projects. In prior years, we have waited patiently and respected the county's decision to advance and prioritize other capital improvement projects for other schools in the county. While we understand the need to manage budget constraints and to balance all the needs of the county schools, we have grown increasingly concerned with the conditions of our schools in the Wooten Cluster. For that reason, various members of the community, including our students and parents, will address you later this week to advocate for more immediate action. As an initial matter, Wooten High School is one of the oldest high schools in the county. Although we appreciate the recommendation for renovations in the current budget, the renovation is not scheduled for completion until 2029. Meanwhile, while the community waits for these repairs to be completed, the conditions at Wooten will only continue to deteriorate. Some of the issues include outdated and poorly functioning HVAC systems, leaking roofs and pipes, outdated science classrooms without updated safety equipment, and bathrooms that are routinely malfunctioning such that students elect to not use them. Of particular concern, the narrow driveway at the front entrance of the school poses a daily safety risk due to the, con due to the congestion caused by pedestrians, school buses, as well as private vehicles. Uh, moreover, Wooten's ADA assessment has revealed extensive high priority accessibility issues which must be addressed well in advance of 2029. Given these concerns, we feel that an accelerated timeline to complete the capital improvement needs at Wooten is vital to the safety and the well-being of our students. Next, with respect to Dufeef Elementary School, a planned extent expansion project was initially scheduled to be completed next year. Uh, however, the school was removed from the CIP last year and a feasibility study was undertaken instead. Leading up to that, several critical maintenance projects were denied and temporary fixes were employed in anticipation of the larger approved project. Lastly, with respect to Cold Spring Elementary School, while we are encouraged by the recommended feasibility study, we also want to emphasize that the scope of the study should address the best way to maintain safety concerns during an emergent situation, given that the school has unique characteristics, such as an open classroom concept without floor to ceiling walls. Ms. Bailey, your time is up. If you want, if you, you have a last line or something you want to share. I appreciate your time and thank you for hearing my concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Scott. Good evening. My name is Catherine Scott. I am a 12 year resident of Lincoln Park in Rockville, a historian by practice and training, and a member of Lincoln Park Civic Association. Like Dr. Donito, who spoke before, my friend and my neighbor, I implore you to restore the funding. Um, that has been proposed to, st to study the relocation of the MCPS materials management facility that borders our historic community. I want to tell you a little bit about what makes our community so special. It was founded in 1891 as a real estate venture that appealed to formerly enslaved people and their descendants. For decades, this historic African-American community has provided residents with a sense of community within walking distance of Rockville's downtown core. The spirit of these trailblazing pioneers is evident in our neighborhood today, with descendants of founding families living next door to new arrivals like me. 
Today, the community boasts a diversity of residents, including immigrants like my husband and three of our neighbors, people who hail from three different continents. Our neighbors include young professionals and first-time homebuyers and aging in place retirees who appreciate the neighborhood's affordability and its proximity to Rockville's urban core. Now, this little piece of paradise has thrived in spite of policy and zoning decisions that have, over generations, restricted our community from enjoying the economic successes and development of some adjacent neighborhoods. Redlining and zoning choices box us in. To the north lies the Washington gas field. To the east, a variety of auto body shops and a blacktop crushing plant that emits noise and air pollution day, all day long. On our southern border is the MCPS materials management facility and the semi-trailer lot that you've heard about already. These zoning choices have limited our community's economic competitiveness as well as, pose, as, well as posing health and well-being challenges. Yet despite these challenges, most of us wouldn't choose to live anywhere else. We simply love our neighborhood that much. The money for this study represents something that would be of enormous long-term benefit to our community as well as the city of Rockville. The relocation of the MCPS facility is a keystone of the city's 2040 plan, which includes the redevelopment of the North Stone Street Corridor. Remaking this corridor, the main entrance to our community, will generate new real estate taxes and small business receipts. It will also improve our quality of life. The funding for this study checks all of the county's Thrive 2050 boxes. One, it addresses racial inequity and social justice for a historically redlined community. Two, it promotes environmental resilience by increasing development opportunity in the Stone Street Corridor within walking distance of a major county transportation hub. And three, it strengthens, it will strengthen the economic competitiveness of a historically underserved community. Come visit our little piece of paradise, Lincoln Park in, in Rockville. Um, and we know that you'll understand why we think it's worth fighting for. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you both for, for joining us this evening. I appreciate it. So now we are going going to go virtual. There are nine uh, individuals who are waiting in the queue to testify on the CIP virtually. First, we're going to go to Mr. Stephen Pollinger. Hi everyone, my name is Stephen Pollinger. Thanks for having me here. Um, I just want to follow up with what Hannah had said. Um, this is regarding the Restoration Center. The biggest issue to this is safety concerns. We've been trying to work with multiple people in the county over many, many months who have been largely unresponsive. They have not provided information or answers after multiple attempts. To, to have discussions, and when they said they would get back to us, they haven't. Um, I personally am also part of the Falls Ridge HOA. Um, as, again, as Hannah said, there are thousands of homes and people in the area. Uh, I had read it was going to be over 1,800 people a day. I'm sorry, a year, 1,800 people a year. That's averaging over five people every single day being brought in and out of a neighborhood. I don't just want this in my neighborhood, but I don't want this in any neighborhood. This is not something that should be in a neighborhood. We really tried to work with the county repeatedly over safety, and we've gotten nowhere. We're basically being told it's going to happen. Maybe there'll be a security guard, but that they can't promise anything. I mean, there's, there's no public transportation between, I think it's 10 PM and, and 6 AM. Um, there's not even a lot of lighting back there. There's children, there's small pets. There have been incidents before. Again, Hannah had mentioned there was a home invasion. Um, and if I remember correctly, I believe an animal was severely harmed or killed. Um, it's just, it's asking for a disaster to happen. It's not a matter of if something's gonna happen, it's a matter of when and how bad. How many residents are gonna be involved in an incident? How badly are they going to be hurt? Will someone be killed? And what's your liability? Factor is something like this, and again, we're not even opposed to the concept. We're just opposed to it being in the middle of a neighborhood. I mean, how, how is everyone on this council, on the board, in the state, 
we've, we've said repeatedly how many safety concerns that are unanswered or unwillingly avoided that are going to be leading to injury. And I want to know how everyone's going to sleep with themselves, knowing we've said repeatedly for months and months, putting something like this in a neighborhood is going to lead to people getting hurt. Honestly, like I'm here, this is my, I don't even know, my fifth, my fifth time, third time, 10th time. I've spent so many hours and we're getting nowhere. And it's very frustrating to, to feel like my safety, the safety of my wife, the safety of my friends in the neighborhood, that everyone's safety is being willfully disregarded. And I just don't understand how you can have so many people, 1,800 people a year, that can come into the neighborhood, have no security when they leave, can leave at will, no one can keep them, people who are mentally ill, people who are suffering, being high from overdoses and other things, that it can just wander into the neighborhood. And no one is seemingly caring that this is a danger to thousands of people. This is a lawsuit waiting to happen. This is- Mr. Pollinger, your, your three minutes is up. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Debbie Rosen. I'm not sure if Ms. Rosen is online. Nope. Okay. Uh, next is uh, Diana Conway. And Ms. Conway is not online either. Uh, let's see if uh, Mr. Robert Pestronk is with us. Mr. Pestronk? Can you hear us? Mr. Pestronk, we see you. Yes, can you hear me? We hear you. Can you hear me? We hear you. You have three minutes, sir. Hello. Yes, I am on and supposedly un unmuted. We hear you. Can you not hear me? Yeah. We're, all, we're giving you a thumbs up here. You want to just go ahead? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. My name is Robert Pestron. I live in Fort. I live at 4701. He's we hear, we hear I you. Keep at going. 4701 Willard Avenue, apartment 1733 in Chevy Chase, Maryland. I'm a 16 year resident of the county. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding upcoming capital budget decisions by council. I focus my comments on the urban parks element, which could unfortunately support the design and construction of a dog park in Willard Avenue neighborhood park in this year or future years. In total, this expenditure could exceed a million dollars. I'm aware of the 2019 study, which argued a need for additional dog parks in Montgomery County, but I believe there are alternative, convenient sites where dogs currently exercise and find relief in the French of Heights, Somerset, and bordering DC neighborhoods. A dog park could be located there if in fact one is needed. A section of the park now currently rented rare green treed space, part of a larger well-used neighborhood park where leash dogs are currently welcome, should be repurposed instead to continue to generate revenue, preserve a home with considerable history, and add other amenities. Neighbors have suggested a mini park accessible to those with physical challenges, a bike rack, tables, paths, all surrounding an urban garden to enhance the park experience. As examples of alternate sites, parks and planning could work with developers and owners of private property in Montgomery County and DC along the Western and Wisconsin Avenue corridors, areas now planned for increased housing density, and potential property swaps. Planning and parks experimentation with a narrowing corridor along Little Falls Parkway presents another practical alternative. Budgets are decisions of both policy and funding. With respect to policy, first I ask the council to amend the urban parks element policy language which currently enables parks and planning at their sole discretion to site and construct dog parks. Any other animal related facility in Montgomery County requires very different steps for approval Last year alone, urban parks dog, uh, dog park language and its processes resulted in three instances of unnecessary controversy. 
the swift shift in attention from Norwood to Willard last year was one of those. I'm pleased that Parks and Planning has taken a step back from the former rapid time frame for construction of the Dog Park and Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park and ultimately will reject, hopefully, any further plans for such a facility there. Second, regarding funding, I asked the council to reduce the proposed and remaining amounts in the Urban Parks Element line item so as to make it impossible for Parks and Planning to construct a dog park or another noisome facility with this funding source. The amounts should instead be restricted to some of the less expensive, less intrusive uses also defined in the capital budget document. I believe the council received additional testimony during hearings concerning the potential and unfortunate idea of a dog park in Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park and the way it was proposed and marketed. I'm also willing to provide background information in support of my testimony or to meet with members of the council at another time. Thank you for your consideration of my request. Thank you, sir. I'm not sure if you hear us, but thank you. Um, uh, next is Anne Oliveri. Hello, I'm here. Can you see? There I am. Yes. There you are. You have three Hi. minutes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anne Oliveri. My husband and I live in West Friendship. Our home is surrounded on three sides by the Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park. We want to express our appreciation for your approach of, approach of listing capital improvement projects by line item especially those related to the Parks Department. It provides a welcome level of transparency, transparency lacking in most of our dealings with them. To be fair, we also want to commend the Parks Department for their willingness to experiment with a linear park planned for Little Falls Parkway. We hope they will include a temporary dog park at this site to better evaluate the impact of a dog park on residential neighborhoods and develop a set of best practices to guide future designs and locations. Better a test site than spending a proposed $1.2 million on a dog park in the Willard Avenue neighborhood park, a cost which is partially due to the need for a stormwater and dog sewage handling system needed to avoid further pollution of the Little Falls Run watershed. So thumbs up to the Parks Department for experimentation and best practices and to you for the transparency of your process and oversight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'll hear a testimony from Tino Calabia. Tino. We see Hi. you. Yes, we hear you. Okay. Uh, Anne, who just spoke now, didn't mention uh, that uh, her house is uh, right next to where the dog park would be. So the loudness factor is also a problem. Anyway, my name is Tino Calabi, as you said. Uh, like several neighbors testifying today, I reside in West Friendship, which is largely located alongside Willard Avenue Neighborhood Park in Friendship Heights. Uh, my wife and I have been here uh, for uh, uh, over 26 uh, years. We thank you uh, for this opportunity to comment on the proposed 2024 budget and CIP amendments. A few homeowner and apartment dwelling neighbors have been touching on shortcomings and how and what we first learned about a dog park project. Would you believe we learned it through a flyer dropped in our mailbox by staffers of the County Department of Parks? My email testimony explains and describes an alternative to the staffer's dog park. Um, it includes also a rendering uh, with a photo narrative, and I don't know if you can see this, yeah. but uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it, it kind of it explains itself. Uh, we mentioned how the Willard Avenue neighborhood park is really a delightfully forested hilly terrain uh, there's a children's playground uh, a basketball half half court but uh, not many can enjoy the park who rely on walkers elbow crutches wheelchairs or other assisted uh, devices to get around the train poses a barrier to folks with ambulatory disabilities who, like me, at age 87, I have balance problems. Uh, the the uh, mini park we envision, though, uh, 
would uh, uh, provide access to so many more residents like me and people with assisted uh, devices. Uh, residents of Willard Avenue's nine high-rise condos, apartments, and our single-family homes. They'll be at least able to enter the small parcel of the park uh, on the mini park, which would be built where the dog park has been attended. Uh, in short, uh, creating uh, the mini park with any such fence will help achieve two more important things. Making an existing poorly accessible park already in our park system finally accessible for those who with disabilities at RC, and two, show the Department of Justice new progress in our Title II agreement compliance. And I mentioned the compliance at more length in my uh, uh, testimony that I submitted by email. Very good. Thank well, thank you very much, Mr. Calabia. Uh, next, we invite uh, Abel Paramadi to join us. Uh, good evening, members of the Montgomery County Council. Thank you for the honor to speak with you tonight. My name is Abel Paramadi, and I'm a student at Montgomery College. I'm actually here right now. Uh, I'm studying information systems with a business minor, and I plan to transfer to earn a bachelor's degree in information systems to one day work for information system securities right here in Montgomery County. Uh, I'm here to, today to make sure that you are, all know how appreciative students like myself are for your support of our college. And I'm here to ask for your continued support. Please continue to provide the quality facilities that students need. I am proud to ask you to support a Germantown Student Services Center, which will house a modern day library and give students like me easy access to important services like financial aid, counselors, and more. All these offices help students, including future generations, make sure that they are getting the help they need and on, stay on track on their education. I am honored to advocate for future MC students to have student services and the library so easy access when they need help the most. I, ask, I also ask for your support to renovate the libraries at the Tacoma Park and Waco campuses. Students need access to modern libraries to study between work and classes. We also need access to textbooks, computers, group study areas, and quiet spaces. Finally, I want to ask you for your support of a future MC campus in East County. Having an MC campus nearby will mean so much. I know when I chose to attend MC, it made all the difference to me, a Damascus High School graduate and a Damascus resident, to have a campus so close to my home. Because of your ongoing support of MC, you have helped me pull myself up from being lost in this world. MC has given me direction and put me on the path to success. After high school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life and found it increasingly more difficult through the COVID pandemic. Once I came to campus and met with the great faculty advisors, and took a tour, I realized that I want to pursue and obtain a degree. Today, I not only attend MC, but I work there and I give cam uh, campus tours to future students as well. Thank you for all you do for Gum Montgomery County residents, and thank you for supporting Montgomery College by providing quality facilities that help change lives like mine. Thank you again. Thank you, and thank you for taking, yes. Round of applause here in the chamber. Thank you for taking time out of your studies to testify this evening. Uh, next is uh, Benaz Menei. Uh, good evening and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Benaz Menei and I reside at 5321 Willard Avenue. I and other neighborhood neighbors have raised many questions related to the proposed dog park in the Willard Avenue neighborhood park that have, been not at, that have not been addressed. I share only two of those questions in my testimony due to limitation in time. Question one, has the project considered the zoning regulations and environmental impacts of the dog park? The MC zoning regulation specifies that in a residential detached zone, animal boarding and cares allowed as limited slash conditional some zones. It further sets standards for an outdoor exercise area to be prohibited and limited and for conditional in some zones, it must ensure 200 feet and other zones 75 feet distance to any lot line. The conditional code must be approved by hearing examiner and must ensure the sound level at the nearest property line satisfies chapter 31B. 
Additionally, all litter and animal waste must be contained and controlled on the site. The proposed plan to create a dog park within a Miller Avenue neighborhood park is similar in nature to an outdoor exercise yard for animal boarding and care. Therefore, the proposed plan must include how it is going to adhere to the zoning regulations, distance to the lot lines of nearby homes and other residential facilities such as apartments. In addition, a study of the sound level and adheres to Chapter 31B must be completed. Finally, and most importantly, with sanitary left um, and cleaning left to the members of the public who use the park, the dog park plan must include provision to ensure the animal waste and associated litter is cleaned up and does not contaminate the stream running through the park. Question two. Should the neighbors of the park, especially the immediate homeowners and apartment dwellers nearest to the Willard Avenue neighborhood park have been included in any improvement decision to the park adjacent to their residence? Though a longtime ho homeowner on Willard Avenue who often visits the park by entering through the Willard Avenue entrance of the park, I only found out about the dog park plans from a concerned homeowner neighbor. Later, it was explained that an announcement was placed on the river roadside entrance of the park. This park can use many improvements, but I do not believe a dog park is appropriate because of the proximity to many residences and a stream running through the park. Other parks in MC have ample seating and areas for people to get together and enjoy the park. This park does not have such basic amenities. I urge that intense land use projects like dog park not be funded under urban park element, which should, uh, which should be used for basic amenities. I thank you for your time and opportunity. Thank you very much. And the final speaker for this evening is Catherine Shelton. Hello, can you hear me? We hear you. Hi. Hey, good evening, President and members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Katherine Shelton. I am an aerospace engineer working as a quality engineer in the space exploration sector of Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Having worked as an engineer for eight years, I'm now pursuing a master's degree in the space systems engineering from Johns Hopkins University. And <clears throat> I am also very proud to be a Montgomery College alum. I graduated in 2011. If someone told me I was um, when I was a student at Watkins Mill High School that I would one day become an aerospace engineer, I would not have believed them. Back in high school, math was my worst subject. But I found my way to MC. I had a few stops and starts on my educational journey, including a stint in the US Air Force. Upon my return, I attended MC and then transferred to the University of Maryland's Clark School of Engineering. Though silently, I wished I could have stayed and have MC be a four-year school instead. My education led to my work today at Hopkins, where I've been involved with the DART spacecraft mission. The spacecraft, built during a pandemic, successfully impacted an asteroid and was the first historical mission for NASA's Planetary Defense Coordination Office. It showed that humanity now has a chance to protect Earth from a possibly catastrophic asteroid impact. My current work is the Dragonfly mission and the narrow angle camera payload on the Europa Clipper mission. The Dragonfly mission is slated to go to Saturn's moon Titan and land a nuclear powered octocopter to explore the richly organic world for the building blocks of life. The Europa Clipper mission will take very high resolution photos using the Europa imaging suite that contains a narrow and wide angle camera. It is these cameras that will capture visual evidence whether there is liquid water and perhaps life beneath Europa's ice, icy shell. I'm here tonight to give back, to ask for your support of the college. I know from experience that quality facilities are critical to a student's success. Please support the college's capital budget, including a much needed student services center at Germantown and modern libraries at all three campuses. Libraries played a critical role in my education, giving me a place to study after a grueling commute between classes and vital technologies. And finally, I'm so excited to hear about the college's expansion into the East County. Doing so means more people like myself can access the incredible education MC provides. I know that many things have factored into my academic and professional success, 
One of the most important factors is the investment that people have made in me. So I want to thank you for investing in Montgomery College by providing quality facilities that have helped many students like me to succeed. Please can, um, support my alma mater, Montgomery College, and thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Shelton. Thank you. Uh, another round of applause. <laughs> Montgomery College uh, certainly making us proud this evening and keep making us proud out in the world and out in the universe as well. So thank you very much. Uh, and then also uh, to, the, to the scouts of Troop 457, I hope we helped you earn your citizen badge tonight. So let us know if you have any follow-up questions. Thumbs up. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, we can do that, yep. Um, uh, so this concludes this evening's public hearing. We'll have another CIP hearing on Thursday at 7 p.m. And we are adjourned. <laughs>